Welcome to episode 116 of Gods and Heroes of Ancient Greece. My name is Mylinda Butterworth, and today we continue with the tales of Troy and part two of The Wooden Horse. So speaking, the old man attempted to proceed all the rest through the wooden door that led into the horse's belly. But Neoptolemus, son of Achilles, implored him to leave this honor to him who was young and content himself with guiding the others to Tenedos. It was difficult to persuade Nestor, but at last he gave in, and Neoptolemus in full armor was first to enter the hollow horse. After him came Menelaus, Diomedes, Stenelus, and Odysseus, then Philetetes, Ajax, Idomeneus, Meriones, Podolirius, Eurymachus, Antimachus, Agnipinor, and as many others as the wooden horse would hold. Last to enter was Epius, the maker of the horse. When he too was inside, he pulled the ladders up after him, drew them into the opening, shut the door, and bolted it from within. In utter darkness and deep silence, the heroes huddled in the horse, not knowing what awaited them, whether victory or death. The rest of the Argives set afire their huts and whatever utensils they did not take with them. Then they boarded their ships, which were under the command of Agamemnon and Nestor, and sailed for Tenedos. This was done according to the decision of the assembly, which did not wish these two to enter the horse, the one because of his great majesty and the other because of his old age. At Tenedos they weighed anchor, went ashore, and longingly waited for the fire signal which had been agreed upon. It did not take the Trojans long to notice that the air was heavy with smoke, and when they peered down from their towers, they saw that the Argive ships were gone. Joyfully, they thronged to the shore, but stopped to gird on their armor, for they had not given up their fears. When in place of hostile camp they found the gigantic wooden horse, they surrounded it in wide-eyed wonder. First, they admired this amazing work of art to their heart's content, and then began to argue what to do with it. Some were in favor of dragging it into the city and setting it up on the Acropolis as a monument of victory. Others mistrusted this strange gift the Argives have left behind and advised throwing it into the sea or burning it. All the while, the heroes hidden in that great belly suffered pangs of anguish at each new proposal. And now Laocoon, the Trojan priest of Apollo, made his way through the crowds. But even before he had reached the horse, he cried, What folly, what madness is this? Do you think the Danai have really sailed? How can you believe that any gift of theirs is without trickery? You know, Odysseus. Either some danger lurks in that horse, or it is a war machine which our enemies, hidden somewhere nearby, will direct against our city. In any case, do not trust the horse. With these words, he grasped the heavy lance of the warrior standing nearest him and thrust it into the horse's belly. The spear quivered in the wood, and the sound which issued from the belly was like an echo from a hollow cave. But the spirit of the Trojans was blind, and their ears did not hear. While this was going on, some curious shepherds, who had come close to the horse, detected Sino, who had hidden under it. They dragged him out and took him to King Priam. And now all those who had surrounded the horse went to see this new spectacle. Sinon stood there, unarmed and apparently numb with fright, and played the part Odysseus had invented for him. He lifted pleading hands now to heaven, now to the spectators, and sobbed, Alas, what land shall I turn to, what sea? For the Argives have banished me, and the Trojans will surely kill me. The very herdsmen who had seized me were moved by these words, and a number of warriors went up to him and asked him who he was and where he came from, and told him that if he was really guiltless, he should be of good courage. 
finally, Sinon, gave up his show of fear and said, I am an Argive. I do not deny it. Misery shall not succeed in making a liar of me. Perhaps you have heard of Palamedes, prince of Euboea? At Odysseus' instigation, he was stoned to death simply because he had counseled his countrymen against waging war on Troy. I am a poor kinsman of this, and ever since his death, I have had no one to turn to. You see, I dare threaten vengeance for the murder of my kinsman, and the son of Laertes began to hate me and has persecuted me all the years of this war. He did not rest until together with false Calchas, he had plotted my death too. For when the Argives at last decided to flee, a plan they had weighed so often, and this wooden horse was already made, they sent Euryphilus to the Oracle of Apollo because they had seen ominous signs in the sky. And this was Apollo's answer. When you left for this war, you propitiated the angry winds with the blood of a virgin. Now you must buy your safe return with blood. You must sacrifice one of your own people. The Argives shuddered at these words, but Odysseus summoned Calchas the soothsayer to the assembly and begged him to reveal the will of the gods. For five days, Calchas, hypocritical Calchas, refused to designate any particular warrior for the offering. Finally, pretending that Odysseus was forcing his hand, he called my name, and everyone agreed readily, for each was glad to escape death himself. The terrible day dawned. They wreathed me as a victim and bound the sacred fillet about my head. The altar, the wine, the flower, everything was prepared. But I broke the thongs that bound me, fled and hid in the reeds of a swamp until they sailed away. Then I crept out and took shelter under the belly of the sacred horse, I cannot return to my country or to my people. I am in your hands. You must decide if you wish to be generous and let me live or kill me as my fellow Argives threatened to do. The Trojans were moved by these lies. Priam spoke kindly to Sion. He told him to forget his cruel comrades and promised him refuge in his city. All he asked in return was information about the wooden horse, which the prisoner had just called sacred. Sinon's hands were freed of their bonds. He lifted them to heaven and prayed with false fervor. You gods, to whom I was consecrated, O altar and sword which menaced me, be my witness that the ties which bound me to my countrymen are severed, that I am not doing wrong in revealing their secrets. Then he began his tale. During the whole course of this war, the Achaeans had staked their hopes on the help of Pallas Athene. But ever since her image, the Palladium was stolen from the temple you reared for her in Troy. All has gone wrong. You Trojans probably do not know that it was taken by some of our men. The goddess was angry and withdrew her favor from the Argives. Then Calchas, the soothsayer, declared that we must launch our ships immediately and return to our own country to find out what the gods wished us to do. He said it was useless to expect victory until the Palladium was restored to its proper place. That was why the Danai at last resolved to sail home. But at Calchas's advice, they first built this great wooden horse as a gift for the goddess. He claimed it would calm her anger. They made it tall and wide so that you Trojans could not wedge it through the gates and take it into your city, because if you did, Athene's favor and protection would go to you instead of the Achaeans. If, on the other hand, you injured the sacred horse in any way, and the Danai hoped you would, Athene would surely destroy your city. They intend to return as soon as they have learned the will of the gods in Argos, and expect to give the Palladium back to the city, which has already been condemned by its own impious deeds. The web of lies was so cleverly devised that Priam and his warriors believed it and trusted Sinon. And Athene watched over the fate of her friends, who sat within the horse shaken with anxiety. Ever since Laocoon had voiced his warning, they had been consumed with fear of death. 
but an almost matchless miracle freed the heroes at least from this one danger. After the death of Poseidon's priest, Leocoon, who was the priest of Apollo, had been chosen by lot to fill the vacant post, so that he was now priest of Poseidon as well. Just as he was about to sacrifice a splendid bull to the sea god, two enormous snakes coming from the direction of Tenedos swam through the glassy water toward the shore. Their heads, topped with scarlet crest, loomed high above the surface of the sea. The rest of their bodies writhed through the water, which moved and splashed with their passage. And now they crawled ashore, darted out their tongues, hissed, and looked about with eyes like flame. The Trojans, who were still thronged about the horse, grew pale as death and took to their heels. But the serpents made straight for the altar where Laocoon and his two young sons were busy with the sacrifice. First, they wound themselves around the two boys and sank poisonous fangs into their tender flesh. When the children screamed and their father came running with drawn sword, they looped their heavy coils twice about him and reared their crest above his head. The flay of the priest dripped with venom. In vain, he tried to loosen the noose of their bodies with his hands. In the meantime, the bull, which Laocoon had already struck with the axe, when he heard his sons cry to help, shook the blade from his neck and fled bellowing from the altar. Laocoon and the children died from the bite of the snakes and the creatures slithered along the ground until they reached the temple of Athene. There they hid at her feet, under the shield of the goddess. The Trojans interpreted this awful event as punishment inflicted on the priest for the doubt he had expressed. Some hurried to the city and made a breach in the wall large enough to admit the wooden horse. Others fastened wheels to its feet and twisted strong ropes to throw over its lofty neck. Then they pulled it to Troy in triumph. Girls and boys followed in solemn procession and chanted hymns. Four times the horse caught on the raised threshold of the gates before it finally rolled over, and four times the belly resounded as though bronze had struck on bronze. But still... The Trojans did not hear, and they conducted the wooden image to the Acropolis amid waves of thundering acclaim. In all this ecstasy of joy, only Cassandra, King Priam's daughter, whom the gods had lent the power of foretelling the future, remained aloof. With clouded vision she saw what was to be. Never had she spoken a word which had not come true, but she had the misfortune always to be doubted. Now, too, she recognized danger and ran from the palace, driven by the spirit of prophecy. Her hair fluttered wildly, her eyes were glazed, and her slender neck swayed like a twig in the wind. She cried aloud in the streets, "'People of Troy, do you not realize that we are traveling the road to destruction, that we stand at the verge of death? I see the city filled with fire and blood. I see death breaking out of the belly of that horse you have brought here so exultantly. But why do I speak? If I used a thousand words, you would still not believe me. You have fallen prey to the Furies, who will take vengeance on you for Helen's marriage. But the Trojans only laughed at the girl or mocked her. At best, one would stop and say, have you grown so shameless, Cassandra, that you, a girl, run around in the streets alone? Don't you see that everyone is ridiculing your foolish talk? Better go home before anything else happens to you. And here is where I end my tale for today. But I'll be back with more tales. Many more tales. Until then, my friends, enjoy the journey.